Great, I needed to be unmuted. Let me, um, my screen, are you seeing it now? Yes, we are, we can see it now. Thank you. So th thank you and I thank the Congresswoman for what were probably kind words, but I'm not sure. So uh, I'm Diane Lauderdale, I'm a professor and epidemiologist at the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago is a campus. Um, it's a private university. In, in the city itself, you can see the lake in the distance up here. Um, and, uh, but we're very much in the city. And a lot of our research focuses on the city of Chicago. What I'm going to do today is, to, is define what public health and epidemiology are. And then I'm going to talk a little about my own career trajectory, which is frankly weird. I'm going to give an example of my research when I'm not focused on COVID-19, which I'm just going to refer to as COVID after this. And then I'm going to talk a bit about prediction models of COVID and why there are so many models and why they disagree. I am hoping to finish this all with time for questions at the end. I think it's going to be a little difficult to interrupt with questions, so write them down or hold them. So public health refers to policies, educational programs, and research whose goals are to protect the safety and improve the, the health of the population, really the whole population. It's distinct from clinical or medical care, which is prevention and treatment of illness provided to individuals by medical doctors or other health professionals. So in the context of COVID, policy is about staying at home or about which businesses can be open or closed. Those are public health policies. Whereas decisions about when to screen, when a doctor de uh, decides to screen an individual patient or to admit that patient to the hospital or what medicines to provide, those fall under clinical care. Epidemiology is really the, um, it, it, it's, it's the science behind public health. It's the study of the distribution and determinants of disease and health states in human populations with the goal of improving health. It, it, epidemiologists study both infectious diseases and non-infectious diseases. People often think because of the word epidemiology sounding a lot like epidemics, that it's really just focused on epidemics and infectious diseases. And that was true until about 1950. And then with the changing um, uh, risks, population health risks that followed World War II with um, the sense that infectious diseases had been conquered because of antibiotics, because tuberculosis, once a leading uh, cause of death, um, had become much less common uh, successes of smallpox and polio vaccines in the 1950s, um, epidemiologists generally turned to the leading causes of death, which were non-infectious diseases like heart disease, cancer, stroke, asthma, dementia. Um, et, however, with the resurgence of infectious diseases, there's now renewed interest in them. And I, I'm a bit un, unusual as an epidemiologist because I've actually worked in both areas. Usually people do one or the other and actually specialize in one particular disease. Epidemiology is innately a quantitative field. It's really based on collecting good data and carrying out statistical analyses of those data. Epidemiologic studies are of two different types, descriptive studies, which define the problem how many deaths there are, how many cases there are, in what population groups, and then analytic studies which seek to understand the determinants of disease in the population. And, and the, the work around modeling that I'm going to discuss is a sort of a branch of analytic studies. A little about my background. So I, I'm a professor and I'm a department chair at the University of Chicago. I came to this via a really strange route, and it's actually not quite as unusual in public health as some other academic fields in a university. I started in college, I majored in the study of religion. I went to graduate school in religion, that's what brought me to the University of Chicago originally, and that's like 40 years ago. I, I did a master's degree in religion, and I was mostly studying medieval religion, early Islam, and Indian religions, and really places where different religious traditions came together. That's what interested me in the historical context. 
I decided I started a doctorate in in religion and then I decided that that was a bad idea because it was going to take the degree typically took 10 years and there really were no academic jobs in the humanities and there isn't much else to do with a doctorate in the history of religions. So then I regrouped and I uh, did another master's degree and became a librarian and I worked for several years as a reference librarian at the University of Illinois at Chicago which is which is the State University of Branson in Chicago. It's different from the University of Chicago. And during that time, I had children. And then when I was in my mid-30s, I decided I'd, I'd made a number of mistakes in my uh, career choices. I had actually taken a lot of math in college as well. And I decided I was simply too quantitative to be in the fields I was in. And I decided to go back to graduate school at 35, and I finished a PhD at 40 which is a really unusual. And then I was really quite lucky that um, a position opened up in a new department at the University of Chicago. So this is really an odd background with strong in humanities with a bit of math. Um, but people come to public health through lots of different paths. And it's actually really useful to have experience in the real world and in other fields before coming to it. Because epidemiology is really about doing research in the real world and the world is the laboratory. And the more that you understand not only biology and disease, but actually social factors, um, it, it's helpful in designing research. I'm gonna quickly give an example of the kind of research I usually do when I'm not working on infectious diseases. And it's about sleep. I've, I've done quite a bit of research recently about sleep as a risk factor in epidemiology. Um, both what are the factors that determine how well and how much different people sleep in the population? And then how are those, how is that variation that occurs in sleep related to people's subsequent health conditions? So when I started this work, there had been a number of epidemiologic studies that had followed people over time and had originally asked when they started following people how much sleep they usually got. And it turned out that people who reported shorter sleep hours went on to have worse health, including a higher risk of death, of heart disease, diabetes, and a number of other conditions, which was frankly a very odd finding, because why was it that people who said they routinely slept five hours or six hours a night were going on to have these worse outcomes? And I brought, there, there were some uh, biological mechanisms that might explain some of it, but but it still was a intriguing finding, which people were very interested in. I brought two questions to this. One is whether this self-reported sleep hours was actually very accurate. And my suspicion was that it was not, that people really don't think about how much they usually sleep, especially they didn't when these questions were asked 20 and 30 years ago. Um, it's been in the news a lot lately, so people might be paying more attention. Um, and and that furthermore, there might be some other factors that varied along with people's self-reported sleep hours that were contributing to the health, to the appearance of health consequences of sleep, but that it wasn't really due to health to sleep as the causal factor. So what I did is I, took, I found an objective way to measure sleep. And, and this is like the research version of an Apple Watch or a Fitbit, but I was doing this at this point um, close to 15 years ago, so those were not available. Um, the research devices are actually better than the consumer devices because you get, the researcher gets the raw data from them and you're not stuck with whatever hidden algorithm the device manufacturer is using to analyze it, which it is not a good situation for a researcher not to actually know how the data is being analyzed, or in fact, if the manufacturer is changing their algorithm, presumably in an attempt to improve it, but you don't know that and you're in the middle of data collection. So anyway, this, it works the same way though. It has an accelerometer in it. It's a non-invasive way to estimate sleep timing and duration and continuity. It records movement counts per minute or per second. People can wear it for several days, which is good because people's sleep behavior changes day to day. It's variable. And then the data are downloaded for analysis and um, you, can, you develop or use programs that distinguish sleep from weight based on patterns of activity counts across different minute epochs. 
So what we did is we added actigraphy to an ongoing study of the development of cardiovascular disease. The study itself was based at Northwestern. So it's a, a lovely example of a collaboration between the University of Chicago and Northwestern, which um, have increased in recent years. Universities didn't used to be as collaborative and they really are much more so now. The parent study was by design um, able to look at race disparities included equal numbers of white and black participants, but actually it was, it was uh, started in the 1980s, which is before uh, the National Institutes of Health had a broader picture of disparities. So more recent cohort studies also include Hispanic and Asian populations as, as distinct groups with enough, enough participants to examine differences by group. But this one, because it was started in the 80s, is, is white and black. And we measured sleep for several nights for about 650 adults aged 40 to 50. This is just to give you an idea of what the data look like from the actigraph. So these, the black spikes indicate how many activity counts there were per um, epic, per minute. That yellow light is a, a, the yellow bar line is a light meter that was on the device. So it tells you when the lights were on and off. Um, we asked the participant to press a little button when they started to try to fall asleep and to wake up. It just put a timestamp on there. It didn't start or stop the recording. And this person I have uh, amused myself by labeling as, labeling as typical, but honestly, this is the best sleeper I've ever seen. So this person, you can see these little diamonds at the top of the blue areas in each night's sleep. That indicates when they push the button to say they were starting to fall asleep and waking up. And you can see they are super consistent night to night. Most people are not this consistent. And then they really slept. There's very little movement. People are not completely um, still during their sleep and they often have short periods of awakening that they're not even aware of. Plus there is some movement that happens happens even while sleeping. But this person slept really well during all the time that she or he set aside for sleeping. And so this gives you a measure of when and how much they sleep and also what a good quality sleeper this was. For contrast, this is like the worst sleeper we've ever collected. It's, they were good at pressing the button. They were consistent the first two nights, the third night they went to bed later, that's fine. Uh, people do that. But um, you can see it's really hard to figure out when this person was actually sleeping and when they were not, and their sleep was short and highly interrupted. Um, so to give you some of the results, the results actually, and this came out in 2006, they were extremely surprising. And I was, you know, like on the Today Show um, talking about it because it was, it was really new data. And what we found is that there were there were social patterning of the sleep hours. And this is one of them that shows you, here are people who had less than a high school education at the left, and then high school graduates, people with some college, people with a college degree, and people who had a graduate degree, post-college education. And the bars indicate four categories of sleep hours estimated from the actigraphy. And you can see that um, there's a real, they vary with the education in a way such that the people with lower education, these are people in their 40s, um, they have on average much shorter sleep than the people with college and post-college education who actually look very similar to each other. And then it, there's a stepwise progression through the less than high school to high school to some college and then to the college and post-college, if you think of them together, with people getting more and more sleep. In other words, people who likely had better jobs and more money um, as a consequence of their education actually were getting better sleep as well. So that was, that was a surprise. And then here is the distribution. Um, these are white women, white men, black women, and black men. And this was the most shocking finding. Now, the, what we see here is that the women, if you look within each race group, the women have um, longer sleep than the men. You might concentrate on here, the really long sleep, the seven and a half hours and more, that there's a real percentage of the women and hardly any of the men. And that the, also among the black women and men, the women have uh, longer sleep. In fact, none of the black men have that longest category of sleep and very few of the black women. But the race difference was enormous. And in fact, the average difference in hours of sleep was an hour and a half difference between the white women and the black men. So what this meant 
was that there were social patterns of how much sleep people got. And people in disadvantaged groups, whether disadvantaged uh, potentially by race, structural discrimination or, or other circumstances or by education, people in less advantaged groups got less sleep. And what that meant was that the association that we had seen between shorter sleep and worse health outcomes could be due in part or completely to other characteristics of people in the short sleep group and not actually to the sleep itself causing the worse outcomes. So um, if you have questions about, hold the, about that, hold them to the end because I'm moving on to COVID now. So I, I have also worked in infectious disease modeling, which is uh, really useful right now because it, um, COVID models are very much in the news and it's really very complicated to understand what's going on with them. I'm sure that you are not all following this as obsessively as I am, but I think there's probably no way people interested in, in science are not paying some attention to this at this point. So um, the reason, so the point of a model is to be able to forecast what's going to happen in the future. And they, they potentially will tell the people making policies like, like our governor, Governor Pritzker, um, the mayor of Chicago, people in charge of county health departments, um, forecasts um, that will help them anticipate the most likely outcomes and medical care needs, to estimate the likely effects of policy changes, and to estimate costs and benefits of different policy choices. And those would be policies around opening or closing schools and different kinds of workplaces and retail establishments, about shelter and home policies, about requiring people to wear masks outdoors, all of those policies that they, we are being affected by. The models have been wildly inconsistent. So there was big news in the middle of March when this British very well-known uh, infectious disease modeler, Neil Ferguson, at Imperial College in London, which is kind of the MIT of uh, the United Kingdom, um, released a report that for, modeled how many deaths they, they expected in different countries, he and his group. And it expected 2.2 million in the US, which was a really shockingly large number. There have been, however, wildly contrasting models. For example, um, in Mar May 3rd, the formal Council of Economic Advisors to the President um, Chair, Kevin Hassett, uh, reported that you know, he produced a model that forecast that deaths from COVID were simply going to disappear by May 15th. I'm gonna show you what that, how that model came to that conclusion. And then in between, the model that's been most often featured um, when there have been White House press conferences around COVID has been the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, which people just refer to as IHME. And that model has been jumping all over the place with death estimates really changing every week with an uh, estimate for the US as low as 60,000, as high as 137,000. It's, it's highly inconsistent. So I wanna explain, and then there are a lot of other models that are being reported in papers. If you go to the Center for Disease Control, which is the National Public Health Agency's website, they link to a lot of different models being produced around the country. And they're, they're variable. I mean, they, they, you know, at this point, they're forecasting differences of about 30 to 40,000 in the number of deaths in the next month. So they're fairly big differences. So what are they? This word model just gets sort of used indiscriminately like they're all doing the same thing. But in fact, there are three completely different approaches to modeling, which it's actually really hard to figure out from the coverage what kind of model each of them is. I'm gonna just try to describe the logic of each, each of them, what they're trying to do. Um, as you may be able to tell from how I I described the first of these. It's, I'm not a big fan of this one. There are many critics, and I'm referring to it as connect the dots. It's based on algebra and on basically drawing lines through the observed number of deaths per day. And I'm going to show you two examples of this. It's, it's definitely the easiest one to do and to understand. Um, the second way use it models disease dynamics, and it's based on calculus. It uses differential equations to um, to, to to make predictions. And then the third one models individuals in a population and how they encounter and react to different risks of infection. 
and it's based on a computational uh, model, a simulation of computer science. So the first one, the connect the dots approach, it draws a curve through a graph of daily death counts to project future deaths. It, it is absolutely, it uses no information, what a scientist would call agnostic to, anything about the mechanism of disease spread. You could take the same approach if you were modeling how, how many times people downloaded uh, a video or, you know, did anything. It, it, it doesn't matter what it is. It's a, it's a bunch of dots, graph dots. Um, I'm going to give an example of an intelligent one, the one from IHME, and then one which I would not call too intelligent, that HACCP model that projected that deaths would disappear on May 15th. So the way the IHME model worked is, um, so what I'm showing here, and I've, I've gotten this from the, the website Vox, but it's similar data are very available in a number of places because it's based on um, the death data counts from around the world that Johns Hopkins University has been posting on their website um, since the beginning of the, the COVID epidemic, pandemic. And the, the, the pink one here is the United States. And so what this is, it's not by a specific date, it's by the date when there were 100 deaths report, reported in each place. Um, and then it sort of shows you how many deaths there are following that in each country. And what the IHME model does is it took at every at any point, so let's say we are on day 15 in the US, they would look at what other country had been, had a similar pattern in their 15 days, which happened earlier, and countries with earlier patterns included Spain, Italy, Iran, and China. Um, and then they just sort of figured that the U.S. would then subsequently follow the path that that other country had followed. As you can see, that was a recipe for underestimating the number of deaths in the U.S. because the trajectory has been much steeper since about day 20 in the U.S. than in any other country relative to how far along it was in its national epidemic. And so the model tended to underpredict. They've gotten more sophisticated with time, and now they're trying to sort of figure out uh, what, what pattern they should be following based on the various social distancing kinds of policies in place in the country or in different states, and finding a pattern of someplace who's ahead of us, um, or a different part of the US ahead of a, another state in order to do the modeling. But basically, it is just a very, it's a sophisticated, curve fitting exercise based on the dots. And it's, it's, it's been underestimating deaths for quite a while. Um, now this has it model um, is, is uh, what they did, what uh, he did is he had this graph of the number of deaths by day. You can see it's, it's really kind of zero until about March 20th, there's just a couple there. And then it takes off and it, it takes off like, you, know, you, you call that exponential growth. It's like doubling every two or three days. Um, and then things get a little crazy. It's, it becomes very variable. That really high dot near 5,000 on one day in the middle of April, that's when New York reclassified a bunch of deaths, um, I think that had happened in nursing homes and realized that they were COVID deaths. So they didn't all happen on that day. They should have been distributed over the previous um, weeks. So, and, and then actually what he did is he just, looked for the best fitting um, a, a polynomial equation. And he looked at, at including up to cubic, a cubic term. And it turned out the cubic term, so what you see here, the straight line is um, a linear term based on the number of days and the counts. It's the best fitting straight line. You can see it's not super predictive, but you could still extrapolate and say, oh, we're gonna see 3,000 deaths. Um, uh, per day by uh, May, you know, whatever, 15th, according to that. But instead, he, just, he, he found that the cubic, putting a cubic term in, so that's the number of days to the third power, actually produced, he thought, the best fit. And that's just, I mean, it might not be a bad fit up to, um, you know, the 29th of April there, but then it just, it's the nature of a, of a cubic term, it falls down. 
And it was staring at this that we heard a statement that this is going to go away without a vaccine. It's going to go away and we're not going to see it again, hopefully after a period of time, which is based on what really is a very naive way to model it, which again has nothing to do with any knowledge of the disease or population mechanisms. It's just literally what's a nice way to connect the dots. So we're now gonna move on to two much better ways to model infectious disease. So the, the second way is the most common way and it's what is behind most of the predictions that you're seeing or a variation of it. And it is, um, it's about, a, uh, the original idea for this was developed almost 100 years ago. It's uh, the classic approach. It's called the SIR model, although there are variations with more letters in there. And that everyone in the population considered as a whole is divided into one of three disease states. They're susceptible to infection, meaning they don't have it, they're S's. They've been infected, or they're I's, and that means that they also can spread it. So they're not only infected, but they're also infective. They can spread it to other people, particularly they can spread it to the susceptible people. And then after someone has been infected for a while, one of two things happens. They recover, and then we're assuming for the moment they uh, become immune and can't, or they're no longer susceptible. They can't catch it again, or some of them are gonna die. And, and those are sort of the two outcomes there. So all three types of people are mixing in the population. The usual model, they're kind of mixing randomly. I'm gonna show you an animation of, that will help you realize what, what's going on here. And when a susceptible encounters an infected, there's a probability that that susceptible will, will transition to infected. It could be a 100% probability. It could be a 10% probability. It's something that you have to figure out what's the right probability to put in the model. And after some number of days, and you also have to figure out how many days that should be, and it can be a distribution of days um, that, that you're randomly picking from for each infected uh, little dot, um, I is gonna transition to either being recovered or death. So the key inputs on this model are the average number of contacts each, per, each little dot is going to have over time, the probability of disease transmission in a contact between a susceptible and infected, the duration of the infected state, and the probability of recovery versus death after the infection. And these processes are represented by equations about rates and uh, they're solved with calculus. They're called differential equations, these systems of equations. Now you can actually, it's really easy to picture how the interventions that are being used affect these inputs. So um, if you want to change, reduce the average number of contacts per person per time, that's why you put in social distancing and you close schools, because that means people are encountering fewer other people, so fewer other, those encounters are less likely to transmit infection. If you specifically want to reduce the average number of contacts for an infected person, then you isolate the infected people um, and you make them stay in their home and even try to isolate them from the other people in their household. So that's specifically trying to reduce the number of contacts of an infected person. If you want to reduce the probability of the disease transmission when a susceptible and encounters an infected person, then you put in some policies that reduce that transmission. And that is exactly what the point of the face masks is. It's supposed to reduce that risk of transmission. And that's also the point of telling people to wash their hands all the time because a, 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 an important way that the infection is transmitted is that virus that from somebody's talking or sneezing or coughing um, lands on another person's hands and then they wipe their eyes or their mouth or their touch their face in a way and, it, and that's how it gets into the body. Um, and I'm just gonna point out here that the point of a vaccine is that it moves a susceptible straight to the recovered phase where they're no longer susceptible without their having to pass through the infected phase. So that's the logic of vaccination. Now we're going to try to get this simulation to work. Now, hopefully, um, yes, new share.
Um, uh, if if um, Ashley could speak up, are you seeing that? We are. Yes, we are. Okay, so this was a lovely article in the Washington Post pretty early in the epidemic that actually explains this. And I'm going to show you first. Here is a little simulation. Now, th those uh, maroon people are sick. Those are the infected. And the gray people are susceptible. And then you can see that um, uh, gradually the infected people turn to purple, which means they're recovered. So um, everybody is mixing like mad in this population. There have been no policies put in place to reduce it. And eventually, everybody is recovered. Um, and what you see in that little bar across the top is at each time point in the simulation, how many people are in each of the three states. So you start out with everybody in that um, aqua, healthy, susceptible state, and then people move into that brown six state, and then they recover into the um, purple state. Now the problem with this unfettered spread is, and this is what was freaking everyone out in March and April, was that if, ever, if this happened, if it just spread unchecked through the population, the number of people who are going to need intensive care in hospitals when that brown hump was at its highest, um, we're going to exceed the available intensive care unit beds and people were going to die just because there weren't hospital facilities. So literally the flattening the curve idea was how do you reduce people's running into other people who have infections so that we spread out that, that brown area. And so I'm going to switch to actually this model down here. I like this. Let me see. Um, yeah. So this is a model where you put in a stay-at-home order and you can see three quarters of the people aren't moving at all and only a quarter of them um, who you know are doing have to go do some grocery or pharmacy shopping or they're an essential they're healthcare workers or they're bus drivers or they work in grocery stores and you can see it really slows down the spread so that the peak of the brown group is not as high and presumably does not exhaust the available hospital beds. And you can see in this situation, there are actually some people who never catch the disease and there are some recovered. And, and so that's the idea behind um, sort of what the SIR model is, is the sort of the calculus behind producing that, that simulation. So let me see if I now get back to I need to go back to my regular screen share. Okay, we're back here. Um, okay, so then, so that was the SIR model, and and people can make a fancier version of it, but it's it's it is a powerful and effective way to model infectious diseases, but it's really quite. Um, it's a, it's a blunt tool in that you can't fine tune things. For example, you might want to look at, well, what about if we just started daycare up for people who are essential workers? You can't answer that question with an SIR model. Um, it, it doesn't allow you to really fine tune things like say, oh, what if we open up restaurants but only let them be half full? It's, that's just not something you can do. So you need a, the third kind of model to answer those questions. But I'm going to say first, and this is the kind of modeling that I've, I've worked on, um, you have to make so many assumptions in building this model that you've perhaps introduced more sources of error, although you've also greatly expanded the kinds of questions you can answer. So um, in this kind of modeling, you actually model each individual in the population and their risks over time as they encounter other people. It's called agent-based modeling, and it represents the individuals as agents in an environment. The model simulates the interactions of you know, up to millions of individuals as they work, play, travel, go to school, anything else they might do. Each agent has traits. Um, for example, they could be different ages, or they could have health states like poor immune function, and, and those could actually influence like how long they stayed sick, sick, or what their chance of death was, or whether their infection was symptomatic or not. 
And then they have our familiar infection states of being susceptible, infected, or recovered. The little agents move around according to a combination of movement scripts and chance. Their state can change based on the infection state of the other agents whose own movement scripts land them in the same place at the same time. So each, um, so the, and then their behavior can change in reaction to their state. So if, if this agent has um, ended up in a grocery store and another agent ended up in that store who was infected and your unlucky little agent became infected, they could then, at the point when they became um, symptomatic, they could uh, isolate themselves or they could not isolate themselves. And you can see what difference that makes. Um, this is a familiar way of thinking from a lot from from the kind certain genre of video games. Um, the old classic is Sim City, but I've been told Minecraft, which I don't actually know, uh, also is an agent-based model at, at its heart. So I worked on a model of Chicago about ten years ago. I started building this model with the complex systems group at Argonne National Laboratory, which is part of the Department of Energy of the U.S. government and has an affiliation with the University of Chicago. And the group led by Charles Makel and, and I, we had a big uh, uh, project funded by the National Institutes of Health to build an agent-based model of Chicago um, to, to study a different infectious disease problem. And this was, this was a while ago, and the problem we were studying was community transition, uh, transmission of methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. Um, which really has faded from the headlines. Um, but the model was readily adaptable to other infectious diseases. And, all, and um, so I, I'm still working with them, although the bulk of the work is being done at Argonne by Dr. Makel and, and his, his colleagues. And I, I talk to them a couple of times a week and advise and sort of we think about what is the right thing to present to the Chicago Department of Public Health, because this model is being, is one of the models being considered um, both in Chicago and the state of Illinois to help guide policies. And it, it gives a different kind of information from the SIR models, which um, are what the other groups contributing are, are using. So what we did is we modeled um, all the places in Chicago, and then our, our agents, we used data from uh, this big national delay data collection from the, from the US federal government, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that asks a random, uh, sam big random sample of people every year on a random day to write out where, where they are over 24 hours. So we got this, from this we got a picture of how different people, different ages in, in, in an urban setting um, uh, sort of spent their days. And we randomly draw from that to give agents according to their age and other demographic characteristics, uh, a, 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 a time script of what they're supposed to do that day. And so the agents move from place to place and their risk of transmission occurs if they are a susceptible agent who ends up in the same place at the same time with an infected agent. So simply, um, you know, it's still got a susceptible, infected, and recovered um, agents. But so if you picture here, let's say there's a household and you've got six people who are all susceptible and a friend comes to visit who's infected but doesn't actually know it yet because they just have a little bit of a cough or something. All of those six people are quite likely to become infected if that person stays there a long time. On the other hand, if let's say this is um, not a home but a grocery store and that's a shopper and everybody's wearing a mask, their risk is going to be much lower than if it were a household without the mask. So it's, it's, it's modeling all these gazillion interactions. So basically, the, the model has 2.7 million agents, the population of Chicago. Um, they move among 1.2 million places, that's you know houses, schools, parks, stores, um, on an hourly basis. If you run it over a year, that's you know almost 9,000 hours. The agents have contacts with other agents. And they can also respond. You can test out um, interventions, public health messages, uh, closing school, opening school, closing daycare centers, opening them, all that sort of stuff. Um, in fact, there are up to a trillion individual contacts during a yearly simulation. And this is part of why this work has to go on at Argonne, because it needs the computational strength that they have to run this model. You need 
really major computational strength to run this um, in a reasonable amount of time. And they want to, because people are being probabilistically um, assigned different activity patterns, and they're, you know, if there's, say, a 20 percent chance of transmission in a particular place, each time they're in that place in that circumstance, um, there's going to be a random draw, you know, and four out of five times they won't get infected, and one out of five they can. So you want to run the model a bunch of times and get an average over the runs. So basically at this point the model is fitting quite well. Um, these black dots are the number of deaths in Chicago from March 27th, and this was the run that was completed um, actually uh, at the end of last week. And you can see uh, starting around April 16th, there's a really good fit. The black line in the middle of the confidence bands reflecting variation over different runs um, becomes quite a good fit at this point. The thing to notice here, which is really, um, it's reassuring to see and it's quite interesting, is that March 20th was when the governor put the Illinois stay at home order in place. Now, when someone becomes infected, um, you know, it's about a week till they have symptoms, and then it's another two weeks if they're gonna die until they're likely, that would be the peak of when deaths occur if that awful outcome is going to occur. And so you actually expect around three weeks after the stay at home order, there should be a flattening because of the decreased interaction among agents. And that's exactly what we see here, that around April 11th, in fact, it goes from being an exponential increase to a much flatter increase. So this is all quite reassuring data. And then finally, this is the kind of thing that we, you know, that, that the questions that the Chicago Department of Public Health have been asking the Argonne Group to answer with this model. And um, just to take, I wanna leave some time for questions here, just a minute. What this is checking is, what would happen if the stay at home order had been lifted on May 1st, that's the bottom left panel, versus June 1st, which is the middle panel, versus July 1st, the black knot line is representing a number of cases. And we're assuming that people are only about 50% compliant with you know, keeping distance from other people, wearing their masks and stuff um, when they're outside. And you see that lifting it May 1st, which did not happen, you will recall, um, resulted in a peak that was higher than anything that was previously seen. And the later that there's an opening, the lower the, the sort of increases after the opening so that um, there are fewer infections after a July 1st opening than a June 1st opening. This of course assumes that people maintain their compliance with the order. And if you also, you can model that people become less and less compliant because they're simply getting tired of being indoors or they're getting tired of wearing masks. You can also model the deterioration in that compliance. And so that, that's kind of the path. There are a lot of assumptions here, but there's also, it, it's really uniquely good for these little fine grained scenarios to try to figure out, you know, what would happen again if restaurants opened or what would happen if school opened, but only half the children were there at a time and it was in split shifts. So I'm gonna end there, leave some time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Lauderdale. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the um, Zoom chat function, and I will read them out for Dr. Lauderdale. So, I mean, you're welcome to ask questions, you know, about epidemiology as a field. Um, oh, I've got a question here. When do you think the best time to reopen the state will be? You know, the modeling I've seen suggests that, I mean, of course, never opening it would keep the cases the lowest, but that is not an acceptable answer. And people are in terrible situations because of employment and, and hunger. Um, it, my guess is that if they're being informed by the modeling, it's going to be at the end of June um, that things get opened up. Um, it's just a guess, but that's what, you know, if, if uh, given what the, the mayor and the governor are seeing, I think that would be a good um, guess. The next one, on your last slide, um, why would the curve go lower with an earlier 
ease update at the end. And the, the reason is um, those, um, the more recovered people there are in the population, the fewer people there are to become infected. So, and this is, if you've heard people talking about herd immunity, that herd immunity refers to what proportion of the population is in the recovered, no longer susceptible state. And so if, if there's more disease earlier, then um, there's less disease later. Um, and that's part of what's going on there. However, I have also asked uh, 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 Charles and, and Jonathan, the people working on it, to sort of, and they're trying to figure out exactly what is going on with some of that. Um, the, basically, if, um, you know, if, if each infected person on average passes it on to two other people, then you need a 50% of the population to be immune um, in order for the number of infected people in the population to decline. And that's where that sort of herd immunity number comes in. The average number of people infected in Chicago has actually gone from three to one um, with the stay in place order. Uh, why do you think, uh, what do you think will be the biggest obstacles to successfully open school? When, how are, ooh, it just moved, uh, students most likely to become infected? I mean, students are likely to become infected when they're in a room without good air circulation with an infected person um, and they're not able to be several feet from other people. So, I mean, this is why one, school districts are really seriously thinking about just having students in, half as many students in because then you could seat them further apart. Um, but it is going to be a risk. Now, until very recently, people thought that the risk to the students themselves, unless they unfortunately had a, a health problem, and of course some teenagers do have health problems, and, um, that the risk to themselves was not great. It was just going to be like having a, a bad respiratory disease. But there's a, an alarming recent reports as the numbers have increased, that there, there are a real number of perfectly well children who get really bad overreaction of the immune system and a, and a uh, very dangerous health condition. So it, it's a really hard um, calculation. On the other hand, the, the long-term consequences of people not getting the benefits of education um, are great. And, and it's, it's, it's harder on people who have less, uh, you know, are less well off at home. Um, you know, they may, they may not have good enough internet for the e-learning, and there are just so many problems being introduced. It's just such a mess for policymakers. Have there been any predictions on what would occur if there was a second wave of the disease? I mean, my they would reimpose, try to reimpose restrictions, and my guess is that people will be less compliant, but we will wait and see how severe it is, and that's why people want to avoid it. There's a lot of, I mean, people are just fatigued with the level of um, restriction. And unless they happen to have been really badly affected by the disease, which an increasing number of people have or their social circles have, they don't really, a lot of people don't get the logic behind what's going on. What do you think the best way to educate the general population about what general infection control and why it's important? Do you think that more education on infection control towards the public would help? I mean, yes. I think there's been very good information. Unfortunately, it's being taken up in a just unprecedented and bizarrely partisan way so that people are listening to different thought leaders and, so, and you know, they're getting some information that is not as scientifically informed. Um, but I, you know, I have to think that people are still, all people are taking in information to some extent and will react. And it's just a matter of people being open to the sources that are providing the information. Um, the, the last one, uh, do, uh, do you have models that show how a vaccine would impact and how quickly it would impact? It's a great question. What other things could schools do to limit exposure? So, I mean, the reason everyone is, um, really eager for there to be a vaccine is, as I said, it moves people immediately from susceptible to immune. It's not sure that there will be a vaccine. There are some viruses 
that nobody's ever been able to develop an effective vaccine like HIV AIDS doesn't have a vaccine and, and dengue fever, which is a really unpleasant disease um, in the Caribbean and the Gulf Coast, that's mosquito borne virus, there's no vaccine. So, I mean, th there, are, there are failures, but being optimistic, um, th th it's going to be a big problem to roll out uh, billions of doses around the world expeditiously. So I don't, the distribution, the making the doses and the distribution are going to be a big challenge. I mean, in all likelihood, what's going to happen is that um, the vaccine is going to be available to lots of people in a particular area. So there are going to be areas where um, basically that herd immunity is reached because of the immune vaccine, the vaccine mediated immune status very quickly. And then other places, um, it's, there's just going to be less supply of vaccine early on. So even though if you're like in a in an SIR model world where everyone's mixing, it's not really going to be like that. It's going to be uh, the case that people who are not vaccinated are probably more likely to run into other people not va vaccinated, and so they're not going to benefit overall, whereas people who are in, in a highly vaccinated area are going to see the, um, the risk just plummet. So it's, it's just going to depend on how it gets rolled out. For schools, um, yeah, I mean, the other, the other things um, are to make sure that there's good air circulation to the extent that windows and doors can be left open instead of closed off. That's tough in Illinois in the winter. Um, and, uh, and to use, you know, to keep people far from each other, to try to keep people from, from socializing up close, which is, which is hard because that's, that's one of the more appealing things about high school. And, um, and, and to, to maintain masks to the extent they can in school, although it is really unpleasant to wear a mask for hours and hours and indoors, it gets hot and uncomfortable. So it's, it is a tough problem and the vaccine is definitely the best hope. Um, why does the R naught for this seem so broad? Do we really know the R naught? That's a great question from someone who's been following things, I, I assume. So the R naught in, and, and it really speaks to how difficult descriptive epidemiology can be, because this should be just sort of a simple calculation from descriptions of, um, of how many cases there are by time, given how long the incubation period is. And it's not simple. And the reason it's not simple is because there, it turns out there are asymptomatic cases and cases that have such light symptoms that people never go to a doctor. It never gets reported to anyone. They just stay home or not. So the early estimates from Wuhan were that r naught was um, over three, but that was likely because they only knew about um, the, they didn't, I mean, there are a number of reasons why it could be a bad estimate. Um, it, it, th this was before they put the social distancing policies in place. There was very rapid spread. There are a great many infected people be before they did anything. Um, the, the estimates though are um, in the US have generally been uh, between two and three. They were a bit over three in New York which presumably got this bounce because of the important role of a crowded public transportation system in New York, uh, more so than Chicago and much more so than suburban and rural areas. Um, it, it, we do see in Chicago a really logical drop from the three before so social isolation to one. It seems extremely difficult to get it below one though. And so at one, it will just be, um, you know, the same level will just keep up over time. It's never, it's not going to disappear till there's a vaccine if r naught is one. So I, I hoped there wasn't really a lot of feedback about whether I was answering all those questions adequately. Um, I hope so. If you really feel strongly, you're welcome to email me if you have questions about this or about epidemiology um, and the field in public health. Um, it's just lauderdale at uchicago.edu. So. Dr. Lauderdale, thank you so much. I know um, I thoroughly enjoyed this and I know our teachers and students did as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you.
Um, and we are actually going to try one more time to show the video of the Congresswoman. Um, we think we figured out the sound, so we're going to try. Okay. Okay. Hey everybody, it's Congresswoman Lauren Underwood. I am on my flight at O'Hare. We are stuck. As you all know, there's been lots of rain this morning. And I think I have to miss the STEM Scholars event. You know, I was so looking forward to catching up with all of you at the end of this school year and um, with all the unexpected uh, life events that we're having. Um, wanted to be able to just Thank you for all your work and hear the wonderful presentation that we had in store. So I'm going to try my best to make it, but if not, um, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, thank you for participating in this program this year. It's been a real honor to work with you. Take care, everybody. Well, okay, I'm so glad that the sound worked. Obviously, the Congresswoman was unable to make it. She was on that flight, um, but Dr. Lauderdale, thank you so much, and thank you to everyone who joined. Um, please feel free to email our office. My name is Ashley Clayton.